Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and um, I've been talking about autoimmunity and issues around the COVID pandemic that I think are really critical for people to understand. This is why I keep talking, because without a grasp of autoimmunity, I don't see how anyone can make sense of what is occurring and worryingly what is likely to occur soon. So I'm coming back to a presentation I did just two days ago because it seems as though it was suppressed. And I don't know why. Why is it that we can't seem to talk about IgG4? And I'll give you an insight into the presentation. The link is in the description if you want to see it. But it seems as though this may be another elephant in the room. Anyway, before I start, just to quickly remind you that we have prepared or pre launch our Kickstarter project, Humming Heroes Inside the Nose That Almost Nobody Knows, where effectively we're just utilizing a story based format to bring across principles and truths around the science of COVID 19. It seems to be more and more important these days because there are just some things that you can't talk about. So, Getting back to the presentation, this was what I spoke about. What happens when the vax antibodies fall? It was just a question. It was, in a sense, a theoretical question, something that I thought was quite relevant and trying to look at the issues around it. And so because it seems that this information got blocked, I'm not sure why, I thought I would share it again. And make sure that if you want to understand a little bit more around it, that you get a chance to see it. I had an idea that I'm going to try and see if I can put across here about what I think is happening with IgG4. Uh, this is an example of um, a hamster on a, a wheel. And this is where I think quite a lot of the world is right now, is that once you have gotten onto that wheel, that vaccination wheel, there is no easy way off. You just have to keep on running. And that's the issue around IgG4. And I suspect that the powers that be, the scientific community, may not want this to be discussed because it has such significant implications. You have to remember, uh, when, I, when I discussed it previously, I'd gone through all the details, so I'm, I'm not going to go through it again, but I'll show you essentially what I was talking about then. So this is from the link that you have there. This is the video, the full video. And I've got a, a few images in there, uh, one of them being all of the antibody levels from uh, March 2023, and critically looking at normal antibody levels after infection, giving an understanding about the IgG uh, antibodies and critically IgG4 here, showing about the fact that they tend to induce tolerance and that they increase almost 4,000 times after mRNA vaccination. And you can see here, that a vaccination with mRNA leads to a 45% of the IgG percentage increase from what is normally about 1%. So this is, this is hugely significant. And critically, it was completely unexpected. So anyone who discounts it and says, oh, it's no big deal, they have no idea. We genuinely don't know the implications. Now, it may turn out that it's nothing big, but we really have no idea about the implications. So let no one fool you that this is either very serious or not serious. I'm not raising the profile to say that it is absolutely frightening in the sense that it is concerning, but I don't know if it will ne necessarily manifest in the context of disease. And so this leads me to share with you a little bit more about what it was that I was concerned about. So. I've got here a few slides that I've put together. So this is what I think happens in the context of infections. I've got two images here. One of them is showing the virus binding to ACE2. And as it gets inside this cell, okay, this is ACE2 attached to a cell, you will then find that this cell then becomes infected. It gets targeted 
um, by the immune system and can get damaged. And the virus could go into multiple different cells. And this is a typical thing that happens, and this is occurring in the bloodstream. Really important to understand that severe COVID-19 is a disease of the bloodstream when it's in the lungs. It's not just the virus causing inflammation. That doesn't really kill people. It's when the virus triggers the cytokine storm that involves the blood vessels of the lungs that we really see severe disease. So this can happen with the virus. But because of ACE2, I've always worried that it can also happen with the spike protein. If free circulating spike protein binds to ACE2, gets inside a cell, it could trigger a similar immune response. And so that's part of the question is that it's not just virus, but circulating spike protein, whether it's from the fact that virus sheds spike proteins or you've gotten it from another source. So that's been the basis of my concern about autoimmunity. And then there is another part of autoimmunity, and it's this. It's what I call the binding of the free ACE2. So I've got here a picture of this is the viral spike protein, and you'll notice on each one of them it has a cap, and the cap is the free-floating ACE2. This, it's important to understand, the reason why I focused on that in terms of severe COVID-19 is that people who have elevated serum ACE2 are most likely to have severe COVID-19. And what I mean by that is, if you look at the characteristics of people who have severe disease outside of the interferon autoantibodies, but older people, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, they usually have elevated levels of free-floating ACE2. And I'll, I'll take you back so that you understand something. In this picture, the ACE2 is bound to the cell. But for some reason in those conditions, there's a, an enzyme that clips it off here so that it's floating in the bloodstream. So a percentage is floating free. And that free-floating percentage could then potentially bind to the spike protein, as you can see here. This is what we have been saying about autoimmunity. And then when the immune system picks up this virus with ACE2 attached to it, it makes antibodies to both. And we do know this occurs in the context of severe COVID-19, that a significant proportion of patients with severe disease have autoantibodies to ACE2. So we know it can occur, whether or not it's the primary mechanism is a different argument. But similarly, I have said that free-floating spike protein could also theoretically bind to ACE2 and also other proteins and therefore become a target for the immune system. So this is where it leads us to that question of IgG4. Because IgG4 is a tolerant antibody. Now, they don't like us describing it as that, but essentially it suppresses the immune response against an antigen. And as I said, the beekeepers being stung all the time by bee venom, the immune system realizes, okay, don't do a severe response every time. That's IgG4. So it causes a dampening down of the immune system. And it could explain why we have ongoing circulation of the virus. So this was the question I was asking. So in this image, I am demonstrating that here, when you have elevated levels of IgG4, it almost acts as a protection against a cytokine storm. And it also would act as a protection against this kind of autoimmune response with IgG4 binding to the spike protein and telling the immune system not to target it. This is where it gets complicated. Because if that is the case, when these IgG4 antibodies fall, that protection no longer exists. And you can then have severe COVID-19 occurring with infection. And this is what the evidence and the research seems to, to demonstrate, that more severe disease occurs the further away someone is from their vaccination. Now, let me just be clear about something. I think already that it's there are already some clear groups. The people who have not been vaccinated and have natural immunity, 
I can't think of a good reason to tell them to then go on this treadmill. And this is this is what I'm I'm talking about, just getting on this treadmill. However, if you have people who are already on this treadmill, have already got elevated levels of IgG4, how in the world do they come off without risk? And this is the point where I say that you have to be quite nuanced in what you're thinking about. What are the options if you're going to see more severe COVID-19 in people who are already boosted when IgG4 levels fall because there is ongoing circulation of the virus? And that's why I'm careful when there are some people who say that you have to take away all jabs from people. I think it's not so simple. There may be a cohort of people who will benefit but who are they? How do we know? When do we use it? And that's where I think people get really, really confused. And the scientific community has not done enough to just ask the difficult scientific questions. Part of the problem is, is that in order to do this properly, we have to acknowledge that there are problems. And it seems as though politically, that's something almost no country wants to do. And so therefore, the scientific community is forced to ignore it because to ask the questions becomes a target. But it is a very important question. We're coming to the point in the pandemic where we're going to see whether or not this is really critical. And if this is correct, and we have a situation like what I'm predicting, that there is a protective effect from IgG4. When it wanes, the likelihood is you're going to see more severe disease occurring in people who had been boosted and didn't take further boosters because there is no other option. In my view, scientifically, I don't think it should be like that. I think there should be other options. Because if you understand the mechanism that is causing the protection. There are other things you can use that can immune suppress the body so that it doesn't respond in that way. But again, doing that is an acknowledgement of a problem and no politician these days seems to want to do that. It seems that a lot of people would rather their populations to suffer rather than to acknowledge an issue, try and find solutions for it, and critically make a difference to protecting the lives of others. We're in difficult times. There are no easy answers, but I advise you, be careful about getting into any ideological camp, whether it's pro or anti. Try and remain nuanced. Try and remain objective. Critically, try and remain scientific. Have a great evening.